Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. My name is Suat McKennett. I'm an international security correspondent here at the Washington Post. And our guest today is Israel's ambassador to the United States, Michael Herzog. Welcome to Washington Post Live, Mr. Ambassador. Hello, Suad. Thank you for having me on your program. Mr. Ambassador, let's begin with the recent attacks that happened in Israel and also that we saw happening in the West Bank. Can you tell us what is the current security situation in Israel? We had a wave of uh, four terror attacks inside Israel, which claimed the lives of 13 Israelis. Um, they are not connected directly to each other. Uh, the two first perpetrators were people who were known to have uh, who are identified with ISIS, and uh, the two others were people, young people from the West Bank who entered Israel and carried out terror attacks in the heart of Tel Aviv. Uh, we do not have any uh, information uh, suggesting that there was uh, an organizational hand in the sense that some organization sent them or gave them orders. It's more a uh, lone wolf attacks, and uh, in such cases there's uh, this phenomenon of atmosphere where people, other young people who look at uh, perpetrators of terror attacks are inspired by them and want to copy them. So that's probably what happened. Uh, our, force, uh, our security forces are determined to take action to stem this tide. And uh, in order to do that, since uh, some of the perpetrators came from the northern part of uh, the West Bank. Uh, Israeli security forces went there in order to uh, uh, take action against uh, uh, people there who were planning further terror attacks against Israel. Uh, we've had a wave of uh, lone attackers a few years back and we managed to deal with it. And I'm confident that uh, this time too, we, our security forces will deal with it properly. But at the same time, Mr. Ambassador, the Palestinian Prime Minister is accusing Israel of further escalating the situation, especially now in the in the holy months of, uh, of Ramadan. Uh, what do you say about that, that in fact the actions of your defense forces might escalate uh, the situation even further and uh, led to more attacks happening against Israel? It is regrettable that the Palestinian Prime Minister pours fuel on the fire. Uh, we didn't st start these attacks. They were perpetrated by people who went into the heart of Israel and killed innocent civilians. And I would expect the Palestinian leadership to issue a stronger condemnations and not just accuse our forces. Our forces went into Jenin to uh, seize a group of uh, several a terrorist who were planning further attacks inside Israel. There were armed people who were on the way to carry terror attacks against Israel. So I would expect the Palestinian Authority to speak against them and not against uh, those who take action against them. You mentioned ISIS. Um, what role do you think ISIS is playing in all of this? Well, as I said, uh, the two terror attacks inside Israel were carried out by people uh, who've known to be affiliated with the ISIS. Uh, one of them, a few years back, tried to uh, go to Syria to fight uh, with ISIS. He was stopped by security forces and interrogated. Um, I, again, I'm not sure that there was someone from the outside giving orders to people. It was more kind of inspirational. Uh, throughout uh, the height of the conflict with ISIS a few years back, only very few people from uh, Israel or from the Palestinian territories went to join them. Uh, they had no great impact, by, but still, they, are, they, they can still, uh, I would say, inspire some people to go out and uh, try and kill civilians. That was the case uh, here, and we should be on the alert. Are you worried, though, that you might see more attacks inspired by ISIS happening in Israel? It could be. I mean, uh, I'm sure that there are uh, more people who could be inspired by them, uh, which is why I think we, we should go on the alert uh, in terms of security. But uh, I think this is also something that we have to pay attention in terms of uh, educating people. It's not, in this case, if we're talking about um, uh, Palestinians, it's uh, their leadership that should pay attention 
and take action against the uh, radicalization of its own society. Ultimately, it's about uh, education, it's about uh, uh, brainwashing, and uh, it's not enough to take uh, preventive or preemptive security measures. We have to think also about uh, the broader picture of uh, uh, counter-radicalization measures that have to be taken. So we did reach out to an ISIS commander over the weekend, Mr. Ambassador, and we asked him about the attack um, uh, or the attacks that were inspired by ISIS in Israel. And uh, we asked also um, if there would be further attacks happening. And let me quote what this person said to us. Um, he said, this was just the beginning and more would follow against, and now I'm quoting, Jews all over the world. What do you have to say about that? So my experience teaches me that when uh, radical leaders uh, uh, stay, make such statements, we should listen to them uh, very carefully and take them seriously. They usually speak their mind. So uh, I would certainly, certainly not uh, ignore it or be indifferent to it. Uh, but this kind of statement also exemplifies some of the challenges that we face in the sense that uh, uh, some of uh, the attacks against Israel are not only against Israel, but uh, against the Jewish state, but also against the Jewish people, as this guy stated to you, uh, which means that some of the attacks on us are also characterized by uh, um, anti-Semitism, and uh, we should pay attention to them. Mr. Ambassador, one other topic that uh, your country always connects to its um, security is the Iran nuclear deal. And as we all know, there might be um, an agreement coming. There might be. We're still waiting. Uh, but your country has voiced um, a lot of uh, cautions and, and criticism also. I think uh, your prime minister even went as far as to say that this deal would actually lead to more violence in the Middle East. Can you explain why? Yes. So our government was uh, uh, very clear about its concern regarding uh, the possible uh, new deal uh, with Iran. The reason being uh, we have no illusion about Iranian ambitions, ambitions, nuclear ambitions and regional ambitions. We have no illusions about their anti-Western and anti-Israel ideology and the fact that they've been working to build the tools, including nuclear tools, to realize their ambitions. Now, this new deal, certainly if you compare it to the original deal, uh, in one sense, you get less from Iran because uh, Iranian advances on the nuclear field bring about a situation where breakout time towards uh, military-grade fissile material for a bomb has shortened considerably uh, compared to the original deal uh, because Iran advanced and manufactures new types of centrifuges that were not at its disposal at the time. Uh, and this uh, is a deal for a relatively short period of time because of sunsets that are supposed to kick in uh, in the next few years. It's a deal only for a few years. At the same time, the deal rewards Iran with sanctions relief, which is not only nuclear sanctions, but also uh, in, as pertains to uh, other destabilizing regional activities of Iran, terrorism, subversion, human rights violations, and so on. It will afford uh, tens of billions of dollars to Iran coffers and uh, uh, Israel's concerns. By the way, it's not only Israel's concerns, also our neighbors in the, in the region, that uh, some of these funds will find their way to Iranian proxies and we will feel it. It will destabilize the region. So for all of these reasons, we are very much concerned that this deal will not add stability, but may uh, be counterproductive. Well, Mr. Ambassador, can we make it a bit more concrete? Can you tell us what are the elements that you would like to see in a deal or in an agreement? Uh, if I had to uh, single out one element, I would like to see uh, a deal without sunsets uh, or uh, if at all, uh, uh, sunsets in a very far distance. But to do a deal that affords you on what it affords only for a, a relatively short period of time, only a few years, uh, for us, this is concerning. 
In a few years, uh, given this deal, all limitations on the Iranian nuclear program, uh, program will be lifted. Iran will be able to enrich its will um, to any level of enrichment with any number of centrifuges on an industrial scale and uh, be legitimized as a nuclear threshold state. This is intolerable to Israel, and I think it's also intolerable to some of our neighbors in the region who may also, in, in that case, uh, examine their own uh, policies and may wish to go down a similar road. But neither you nor, nor your neighbors are the ones who are negotiating at the moment with the Iranians. So do you feel or do you think that the American administration, that also the Europeans, do understand your concerns? Do they hear you? Are you in contact with them? We have a very close dialogue with the administration, also uh, with our European counterparts. Uh, we discuss everything with them. It's an open dialogue. We share our information. We share our concerns. Uh, I will not hide that there are differences. They are known. We make them public. Uh, so the problem is not whether or not we have a, a channel of dialogue. We do, and it's in a very open one. But as you correctly noted, we are not at the table, neither Israel nor our Arab partners. But ultimately, we live in the region and we bear the consequences. So what's the alternative? Well, the discussion between uh, this deal and no deal is a difficult one because both options are unappealing, unfortunately. To me, the most critical element is not whether you do a deal or you don't do a deal. It's whether there is a, uh, whether you have deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Iran is a, a predator state. Iran is a destabilizing factor in the region. And no deal will put Iran in the box unless there is a serious deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Iran. And I would like to see that deterrence in place with or without a deal. But Mr. Ambassador, would Israel really be safer also without a deal if there were no restrictions on uh, uh, Iran's nuclear program? As I explained, uh, we have, uh, of course, there will be consequences with or without a deal. Without a deal, I assume Iran will continue to develop its program. With a deal, it will be legitimized as a nuclear threshold state within a few years and then can decide at will whether to cross that threshold. So. Neither options are uh, appealing. I do believe that there are options to counter Iran. It's not that uh, either you do a deal or there's nothing to be done. I, I do believe that you can deter Iran if you take the right policy. And uh, I do believe that if you reinstate deterrence, you'll prevent war. Uh, I certainly believe that uh, if you show uh, assertiveness vis-a-vis -vis Iran, as Israel has shown in the last few years in the region, you will deter Iran. Iran, with all due respect, is not an 800-pound gorilla that cannot be deterred. So what would Israel be willing to do then in case there would be a deal that is not um, or an agreement which uh, Israel don't think is, uh, is, is uh, representing its interests? Uh, what would Israel our do? Leadership, uh, our leadership stated more than once that uh, we are not part of the deal, we are not signed of the deal, if there is a deal to be had. And therefore, we maintain uh, our options open. We will build our, build our capabilities to counter Iran. We will maintain our freedom of action. And we'll decide uh, in due time what action to take. But of course, we are not going to sit idly by or be indifferent to the situation where Iran uh, is legitimized in a nuclear threshold state. Let's move to another topic. Uh, there's the ongoing military action of Russia against Ukraine. And there have been several attempts also by your prime minister to uh, mediate between the two different parties. How is that going? Is there, is there still a chance for a diplomatic solution for, in your opinion? First, let me uh, uh, state here that uh, from the beginning of uh, this uh, war, Israel uh, unequivocally stated that it is against uh, the Russian attack on uh, Ukraine, against upsetting international uh, norms and, uh, uh, and against uh, uh, going against any territorial, the territorial integrity 
sovereignty of uh, Ukraine, and we have provided a lot of assistance, uh, humanitarian ones. We also op opened the field hospital uh, a while ago in inside Ukraine, manned by Israelis, which uh, has treated over 1,500 Ukrainians uh, to date. Uh, our Prime Minister decided at one point to uh, try his hand as mediation. Uh, he was asked by some international leaders, especially senior European leaders, to uh, intervene and see if there is a potential diplomatic outcome, which is why uh, he engaged both parties. All his moves were closely coordinated with the U.S. administration, and uh, he talked to Zelensky before and, ev and after each and every move that he has taken. My understanding is today this has not produced any uh, breakthrough. At one point, the Ukrainian leadership asked our prime minister to uh, convene a meeting between the parties in Jerusalem. That hasn't happened. Right now, I, I don't see a diplomatic outcome in the cards in the foreseeable future. Uh, so, unfortunately, uh, we are in probably for a, a prolonged war. However, is, is the Prime Minister still in touch with Vladimir Putin? Uh, my understanding is no. Uh, right now, he is not leading the efforts to mediate. Uh, he was active uh, there, he was leading the efforts a few weeks back. Uh, I think uh, Turkey is leading some of the efforts, some others. Uh, uh, Israel is no, more, more, uh, no longer leading these uh, efforts. Mr. Ambassador, it took Israel, though, a bit longer to condemn the actions, or at least this was how the rest of the world uh, felt about it. Um, it was your, your foreign minister who first uh, condemned the actions of, of Russia strongly. Why did it take so long for Israel to condemn Russia's actions? Uh, I disagree with the premise of your question. It took Israel a day or two, but we condemned unequivocally. Uh, we co-sponsored uh, two General Assembly resolutions uh, against the, Iranian, the Russian attack, and we voted in favor. We voted in favor of a third General Assembly resolution calling for uh, the expulsion of Russia from the Human Rights uh, Council. We've been very clear, uh, including condemnation of uh, the atrocity of Boca, so I, I disagree with those who say that Israel hasn't decided uh, about uh, taking sides. That's absolutely not true. We do have some constraints because we have a Russian military neighboring us in Syria, and uh, we have. it's critical for Israel to maintain freedom of action against Iran in Syria and the region. As I explained earlier, when you asked me about Iran, so uh, that is something that we have to uh, take into consideration. Uh, much the same as uh, the international community uh, uh, is uh, very careful about enforcing a no-fly zone. Each nation draws its own lines, but it doesn't mean that if we haven't taken sides. We have very clearly and unequivocally taken sides, my government, myself and uh, all of Israel. Mr. Ambassador, can you explain to our viewers, though, why is Russia so important uh, when you say Russia is in Syria? So can you tell us why, where is Russia helping you there sure. or how is Russia helping we, you? We have the Russian uh, military uh, deployed in Syria with uh, very advanced air defense systems, S-300 batteries, S-400 batteries, advanced radars, very advanced warplanes. And uh, we have, a, uh, since we uh, often take action against Iranian military targets in Syria and in the region, uh, it is critical for us to maintain that freedom of action because Iran is our existential problem. And uh, we don't want to be in a situation where we, we risk that freedom of action and the Russians can disrupt it. So uh, again, that's the constraint we have. But short of that, uh, we do everything we can to help the Ukrainian people. Uh, since the start of this conflict, uh, Israel has seen also an influx of um, refugees from Ukraine, but also from Russia. Can you tell us what is Israel's policy um, for in, in case of like accepting refugees? Israel uh, opened its gates and uh, today it accepted more than 20,000 Ukrainians. 
and uh, they are more uh, knocking on our doors and uh, wanting to come uh, to Israel. Uh, there's a big uh, uh, Jewish community in Ukraine, but not only, not only Jews, uh, more than 50% of those who arrived in Israel are non-Jews. We now have also uh, many Russian Jews knocking on our doors. There are 600,000 Jews in Russia. Uh, many of them feel trapped. Uh, a lot of them don't leave because the Russian uh, regime would not let them leave with more than $10,000. But uh, notwithstanding, uh, many, many people uh, would like to come to Israel to escape the war. A summit meeting was held uh, in Israel in the Negev and attended by the foreign ministers of the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco and Egypt, along with um, your foreign minister and um, the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. Uh, during the summit, Israel and uh, its new partners uh, said there would be a closer cooperation uh, on different levels. Can you tell us what exactly they meant by that? I was present at the Negev summit. I must say it was very exciting. There was a sense of history in the making. There were six foreign ministers, Secretary Blinken and uh, our foreign minister and four Arab foreign ministers, foreign ministers, three of them visiting Israel for the first time. Uh, there were the foreign minister of the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco and Egypt, a very important summit. And uh, the discussions there were uh, very interesting. The parties discussed not only security concerns in the region, like Iran, of course, which is a major topic everybody discussed, but also a means of uh, regional cross-border border cooperation. There is a sense that there is a huge potential that if you really want to overcome some of the major challenges in our region, we have to join hands and work together so uh, the parties discussed a, a very rich agenda of cooperation in areas like climate change, energy, fighting the pandemic, food security. We decided to establish six working groups and almost all of them deals with these kind of things. I think there is a huge potential. We welcome the US involvement in expanding that uh, agenda and making it happen. I would like to see a proactive uh, US role in that. So I think uh, for our region, uh, this is a very key, important factor for the future. And since we are now fighting some forces that uh, are destabilizing our region, like Iran and its proxies, that type of cooperation is extremely important. So are you also suggesting that there might be a closer military cooperation here? Some people even said maybe a future for a group uh, like uh, NATO in the Middle East? We're not building a military alliance, let's be clear about it, but uh, we're building cross-border cooperation, which is mostly civilian. But I also think there is merit in thinking about a regional security architecture long term, which uh, will help, help stabilize our region. U.S. Secretary of State Blinken said during the summit, uh, and now I'm quoting him, these regional peace agreements can't be a substitute for progress between Palestinians and Israelis. Is he right? Well, that certainly uh, was a topic that we discussed at the Negev summit. And I, I certainly uh, believe that Israeli armed normalization also offers benefits for Israeli-Palestinian relations because I believe that uh, Arab involvement could uh, uh, open space, more space for both parties uh, to engage. And I believe that the Arabs are also stakeholders in some of the most important core issues separating between Israelis and Palestinians, like security, refugees, and some other core issues. Uh, so I do hope we will find a way to operationalize that uh, potential so that uh, the Abraham Accords uh, uh, also benefit the Israeli-Palestinian context. There's certainly a potential there. But Mr. Ambassador, let me ask you, you were, Israel was able to, um, to, to cut deals with all the other states, with Morocco, with the UAE, Bahrain. Why is it so difficult to find an agreement with the Palestinians? Well, uh, I could give you a lecture a whole day long because I spent, uh, 
I, I spent over well over 20 years of my life negotiating peace with the Palestinians. I was in all Israeli-Palestinian negotiations beginning in 1993, including Camp David, Taba, Annapolis, with Secretary Kerry, back channels, you name it. It's a very long story. Essentially, we're talking about two national movements with claims to the same uh, piece of territory uh, with conflicting narratives, and it's extremely difficult to over uh, to to bridge over these gaps. It's not that we haven't tried. We tried for many many years, and there were all sorts of offers on the table, uh, and uh, we failed not for lack of uh, trying. I think in order to bring about a, such a deal between Israelis and Palestinians would require a certain set of uh, conditions, including uh, uh, leadership on both sides who can communicate and, uh, and take decisions, like we had uh, between Israel and Egypt or between Israel and Jordan, where you have a leadership that uh, on both sides that uh, could take such measures. Uh, an effective third party mediation, marginalizing the radicals and the extremists who work against peace. It's a very long story. So again, we fail not for lack of trying. I would say that it, it's time for fresh thinking about what went wrong. And I do believe that involving some other, uh, other actors like the Arab could help us. Mr. Ambassador, brief uh, question and answer, please, because we're running out of time. How is the situation of your government? Will there be new elections? Well, I'm not a political commentator and I can't tell you whether or not we'll have elections and where. It's no secret. Anybody who reads the headlines know that uh, there is a political crisis in Israel, but uh, the government is still there. Still, it doesn't have a, a majority in parliament, uh, nor does the opposition have. So it's kind of a limbo, but uh, it's too early to tell where this is going to lead us. And I hope that uh, Israeli politics will, uh, will stabilize soon. And so uh, when do you think there will be an answer, uh, whether you might have to head into new elections or not? I, it may take a while. Our parliament is now in uh, recess. So maybe after it reconvenes in May, things will be clearer. But uh, the government is still in place and taking decisions. One thing that you also discussed with US officials here was the increasing anti-Semitism um, that we have seen in the United States. Are you, um, what, what actions is your embassy going to take against that? Uh, we're very much concerned about the rise of uh, anti-Semitism in, uh, in America, not only in America, but we are here in, in America. And uh, I think that uh, you need a very broad uh, effort encompassing all dimensions of the problem, education, enforcement, security, and many other dimensions. I was heartened to see that uh, Deborah Lipstadt was just confirmed uh, as the administration uh, point person on anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, we, for our part, uh, are certainly uh, going to cooperate with whoever is willing to partner with us to fight this ugly phenomenon. Thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, we have to leave it here. We are running out of time. Um, thanks for joining us here at Washington Post Live, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much, Suad, and thank you to all our uh, watchers and listeners. It's been a pleasure. And thank you all uh, for watching us. My name is Suad McKennett, and if you would like to know more about our upcoming interviews, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and receive more information about our upcoming programs. Thanks again for watching.